next um, guest today is Sandra Simons. Um, she's the author of uh, six books of poetry, Orlando, which is forthcoming in 2018. Further pro problems with pleasure, which um, we have here, uh, which was the winner of the 2015 Ekron Poetry Prize. Steal it back, uh, the sonnets, mother was a tragic girl, and uh, Warsaw Bikini. Her poems have been included in the Best American Poetry 2015 and 2014 and have appeared in many journals including Poetry, the American Poetry Review, the Chicago Review, Granta, Boston Review, Plowshares, Fence, Court Green and Lana Turner. In fact, I read today that one of her poems is uh, forthcoming in the um, New Yorker, right? New York, New York Times. The New York Times. Oh, the New, New York Times. Oh, New York Times. Okay. Um, well, in the New York Times. All right. So um, in 2013, she won a Reader's Choice Award for her sonnet, Red Wand, which was published on poets.org, the um, Academy of American Poets website. She lives in Tallahassee, Florida, and is an assistant professor of English and Humanities at Thomas University in Thomasville, Georgia. Uh, so both our guests are currently in Georgia. Um, so welcome, Sandra. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I am so excited to be here. Thank you, Brigitte and Jana. It was a wonderful reading. Um, so yeah, um, I am. Um, Great to hear your work and read with you. So I'm going to read um, some poems from uh, this book, my last book, Further Problems with Pleasure. Um, can I stand up? Is that is that okay with that? Okay. Um, I wasn't sure if there was a technical thing going on. Um, yeah. So this poem, this first poem, is called. Uh, Fun Clothes a Gothic, and it is about the mall. Um, and the sort of the thoughts that went through my head in the Tallahassee Mall. But it's not as like, when I say it's about the mall, that seems really ditzy. Um, but I think it's like a highly intellectual poem because there's Walter Benjamin in it. And um, he's really smart. Um, okay, so Fun Clothes a Gothic. Schizophrenic like suds in the afternoon, bubbles and bubbles of the glorious prism, molds of forensic happenings, and you speak softly in a delectable armory in feathers, busts, bras, not afraid of being impoverished, afraid, alas, that this disguise will morph to human flesh. The underneath in chains that vibrate the invisible soundscape of deposits. A debt the color of frog skin. How can he hold back the incredible lush device that is the body? That is the last of the last. The one whose dressing room appears in the negative. A cold cloud. Sound of the funerary ocean, cobalt abyss beckoning like rain, like rain down the spine of beauty, like loosening shivers, like, oh, this archaic mall, once the epicenter of commerce and crime, and now how it's just opals of dwindling energy, a caveat for cowgirl boots with Christian crosses stitched all over them, a cache of zirconium, encrusted socks, and the long tan arms of the lemon girls, whose promises you already know are lies, but you buy a few anyway. Why? Just because there's no reason not to. A parchment of brain matter, the guessing game, some pathetic employee made of ham, some ham made of polyester, some polyester made of the light organs, and still they built this mall on a plan of mild humiliation, like meadowland that makes us feel somehow inept when facing its triumphant posture of flower, 
water, seed, more the appendectomy, the obligatory jog on a work day. See how the light gathers in these bent arcades. I have followed you in decades past. Your memory like mother who took us to buy guest jeans. The feeling intense as light stored years back, confronted, denied, laughed about, but it wasn't funny. None of it was. And settling on junk, since that's what this is, multicolored, made from the laugh lines of others, detached, touched, how I want you so much and how this shopping mall does the trick. It always does. Don't humiliate me, though. I know I look ill, out of place, and old in this leotard, but still I was compelled into it, catapulted into it, thrown into it, and I couldn't stop myself, couldn't resist it, and when I touched it, I was like Eve who could not resist what she would become. I thought it would transform me like something deep within Ovid, or that inside my soul I was indeed Ovid, and that if only I put on the leotard, I would become Ovid again and again, and you would want me back, see? So it made a kind of sense, the kind of sense a muse, make when she, muse makes when she says the word Givinche. I could become that, right? or something like Givinche, better even, the breasts more solid with the lineage, a straight line from the golden age of all breasts. Givinche, Italian, located in the place you don't, where you don't have to work, where there's no loneliness. Givinche, that frilly island, Givinche, the Greek, how I want you, Givinche, to bleed your melancholic streaks of song into my song. You are an owl to me. You are the song of songs, Givinche, Gestapo, Givinche. And I know you know how to teach me to remember how much nothing transforms, and how you said there was beauty in the emerald, and how you claimed it was enough, but it was not enough for me. And when you made me feel guilty for wanting more from you, you and then you said, I can't give you anything but beauty, the, the dynamics of the trend. That's all I can give you, Sandra this decrepit shopping mall with a sad car parked in the middle of it, the knotted terror of the paycheck. That's what you said you could offer, bad value like bad love. And I bought into it because I was desperate, not for you, but for that anxiety to leave my body, to make its final exit. I do not fear death, Javinche. I fear you will overtake the sublime knowledge of poetry and nature, so I must beat you back to powder beat you out of my mind and body like a power structure, a war on war, a breakdown of the light your mall constructed, and a breakdown of the mall in the mind that you have constructed, and a breakdown of the neuron mess that we have constructed out of these sad bits of culture, cloth, and human longing with your opulent maison. And one by one we will burn your maisons and the websites of your maisons and your models and your actress models, and your poet models, and your novelist models, and your great conceptual artist models, and there will be nothing left of you. You will be out in the cold when the mall is not burned, but gone, wiped out, no trace of it for miles and miles around, nothing left to transform into or out of. So I walked out of the mall into the glaring and relentless prison of the present. And I realized I was a fool, a victim of false hope, and how even that epiphany is so dull I'm embarrassed. And when I walked out of the mall, I realized, but hell, I realized nothing. I go home not Ovid, but me, a sandstorm. I go home not me, and not you, and not me and you, and not Ovid and me and you, just me and my leotard so out of touch with reality, so out of style already, that nature mocks it immediately, and there's nothing the moon or sun or stars can tell me tonight to make it better. about grading um, humanities tests online. <clears throat> I grade online humanities tests at McDonald's 
where there are no black people and there's a multiple choice question or white people about Don Quixote or Asian or Indian people. I don't want to be around people. I want to be here where there is free wireless. I do not want to sit at the Christian coffee shop or the public library. No, I want religion to blow itself up. My sister converted to Catholicism. I do not want to sit at Starbucks. I do not, I like McDonald's coffee because it is cheap and watery. I like how it tastes. I like the table where the old man is telling his old friend about the baby black swans he would feed corn to in Cairo, Georgia when he was a kid. No, Mark Twain did not write Don Quixote. I'm going to be here a while in this fucked up shit. You can get an old Crown Vic police car in Cairo for $500. So I read a poem by James Franco in the literary magazine I brought with me. My mechanic wants to fuck me, and the poem isn't as bad as people say he is bad. One of his friends dies in the poem. He uses the word cunt. I don't know what to make of it. I read it as Canute. The medieval prince of Denmark who ascended and ascended to become the king of England. I bet some managers here could relate to Canute. Send me a pic of your cunt. The mechanic says, I miss you. I say, what do you miss about me? He says, your big tits. Elliot Smith is mentioned in the Franco poem and might or might not be a cowboy. Maybe Franco really is bad after all. The Crown Vic is a vehicle the way the police always say vehicle, not car, but the mechanic always says car, not vehicle, because I teach the police I know how they talk. The mechanic says, Alice, stop speeding, and do you want to see a picture of my wife? No, Cervantes did not write because I could not stop for death, and I will be sitting here all day in this fucked up shit, God damn it, click, click, click. <laughs> I keep looking at things like pictures of your husband, which make me feel sick and watery. Now a young boy, maybe eight or 10, in, is in a booth across from me, and he's telling his mama his daddy's new girlfriend is ugly. She's ugly, mama, and trying to comfort her. Do you want to meet me in the Home Depot parking lot? I don't think this is a good, and if I find you with him, I'll kill him, and I'll kill you, and no one will know where your body, but your husband isn't ugly. He is beautiful, leaning over to look at himself in pond water, or leaning over masculinity itself, leaning over the family he has made for himself, and the pond is male because he owns, because he owns the pond, and the guns are male because he owns the guns, and what's happening is male because he owns the factors that go into the car is male because he owns the police, and Home Depot is male because he owns and owns and owns, and all he can do is own everything that will rot, like privacy or speech or porn or black swans or my big tits, which he misses. Fucking swans. A man decides to sit next to me and he is frantically hitting his Egg McMuffin on the table and then walks outside and smokes a cigarette and returns to his seat and starts hitting his Egg McMuffin again and again and he sees my computer and asks to check his Facebook. So I let him and then he wants to be friends on Facebook <laughs> and leaves his phone number on my page and I like it and then in the background the little boy's like, Mama, she's ugly. Mama, she's so ugly. And the mom is like, is she? Is she ugly? And, and I think the mom is ugly, even though I don't want her to be. And the other kids are at the booth. They're drinking milk, and they're chubby and eating fries and saying, yeah, she's ugly. Yeah, Mama, she's so ugly. You wouldn't want to meet her because she's so ugly. So that's a feminist poem. <laughs> so if you're offended by that um, because of the language, just remember that women have bodies. We, and you know this is about sexism and, and, and bodies in public space. So um, I think that's something important to keep in mind. Not that you, you all are cosmopolitan enough not to be offended by poems, right? <laughs> <clears throat> um, okay, uh, a lot of my poems are anti-capitalist poems, um, and this is one of them. Um, this is about having kids in the capitalist society that um, demands a lot from work 
first, and specifically women. Um, so uh, this is also you know, a poem that's um, about the humanities from this book. <clears throat> I am inside the humanities, and if I step too far out of it, I'm dead. The figure at the top left corner is securitas. No rent, no work, no wages, no more. For those thinking of disturbing the peace, let the hanged man be your warning. In order to write this poem, I paid daycare $523 for the week. Make sure you premix the bottles, bring diapers, make it worth something this time. Mayan countdown clock to Mayan countdown clock, two bodies in a bed wanting the water of the world to give them back a pyramid. Also the bronze head of Adam. Also the world of children, their toys, the plastic imitation food, eggs, miniature cereal boxes, deformed mirror to the real. I could not keep working to make money for the people I despise. Nothing is right, but I couldn't afford not to either. Late at night, Craig said, I hate my job. The hydrologists have to give permits to gulf oil for more water or someone will get fired. It was winter in Florida. The path to all principles of all inquiries led back to this one statement, like a receipt from Publix, I was teaching the humanities again. In the garden of fallen aristocrats, where no one sits on the lawn, it is as if heaven is on one side, hell on the other, and somehow I have slipped very far into the abyss between the two, an abyss that contains suns, the way black holes do not give back the history of light, the way a galaxy turns like a clock into the desperate desire for water, and these flowers, what can I make of them? They bloom like idiots, live as thieves. I get Craig's cryptic text from West Florida, um, from West Florida on my walk at Lake Ella. No coffee, nuclear power plant, and then he sends a picture of some industrial map of rest. O Apollinaire, O de V, in this garden, which is a mockery of all gardens, in this bed, bath, and beyond of the intimate, remember me. My daughter is 43 pounds. I know what is real, and I know how to steal back what is mine. Do you guys want to hear my I, I Hate My Landlord poem? <laughs> More anti-capitalist poems? They're going to walk out of here all communists. It's my secret plot. All right. This is a, called a poem for landlords. Today I paid my landlord at the last possible minute on the last possible day of the month, which is the fifth day of the month. It is the 5th of November, 2012. Poets hate their landlords. This is an imperative. It has no grammar. Maybe it has a crude grammar. I am not writing this check until the last possible minute in my car because I have so much hatred in my heart for property and landlords, but not land or streams since I love the romantics, since I am also romantic, when I am not practicing stupid conceptual poetry like going to TJ Maxx and looking at my face. I have been thinking of the body of my three-year-old and how it is so new and unstable and how I don't want him to ever feel happy in this world. I don't mean it like that. I want him to feel joy, but not happy in the sense that he feels content. I want him to feel contempt for landlords the same way that I feel contempt for landlords and how I've hated them all in exactly the same way, which is an abstract hatred since it reaches into the future, as well as a concrete hatred, since it is right here in my parked car as I write this rent check, and how this hatred is sophisticated in the manner of a Marxist, and how it is unsophisticated, like the juvenile delinquent I will always be, even when I'm very old, because for whatever reason, that simply could not be beaten out of me. So back to this check I don't want to write, 
and writing the numbers of amounts of money in my name in cursive, which is the last place in the world in which I use cursive. And this is also the last place where I write checks. And how if I don't do this, I would need to get a money order from now on to pay the landlord I despise, who are all exactly the same and whose threats are all exactly the same. I don't want to feel this hatred. My daughter is 20 pounds. I want to feel joy. I want my little infant to feel joy. And I don't want her to grow to be happy. I don't mean it like that. I want her to feel joy when she walks in a forest or by a river looking at birds. If she feels one day a seething contempt, I will be proud of her, for I shall know she is my daughter. I know that I should be happy for my children if they are happy. Oh, don't become tax collectors. I'm writing this so quickly. Soon Craig will be home and I will need to breastfeed and cook dinner. I'm writing this so fast. I will not be able to look back at it, but just now I am looking back at it since I made dinner and cleaned the house. And I'm also revising it and thinking about how my anger has subsided because at dinner Ezekiel told me he kissed his friend on the cheek at school. And he says, is it, okay? it is okay to hug a friend, but we don't kiss friends at school. I will post this on my blog immediately. It is the November the 5th, 2012. So um, I do, <clears throat> do, are you familiar with Charles Baudelaire, the poet? Maybe some of you are, maybe. He's a French poet, he's kind of pretty famous. <laughs> um, so I do fake translations of him. Um, I call them fake because they're like, basically have nothing to, a little bit to do with the original poem, um, but not much. Um, and um, so I'll read a few of these, um, the one, and I'll read the one that's gonna be in the New York Times. Um, and um, yeah, so. The first one is called Destruction. There's a demon on the Oregon coast whose pale form swims towards me, but I am an avalanche of air. My desire is brutish. I can't couple with anyone. Sometimes art takes the form of the seduction of women, or I give women some sort of pretext to account for myself and my art, which is in itself a hideous form. Sister, why do you think I should look toward God? I'm tired. I'm in the middle of some feast of tiredness and it's just the Sahara Desert here and will be forever. You throw sand in my eyes to confuse me, and I cry, demon, leave me alone. Don't open the door to this stupid destruction. A martyr. There's also a figure in here called Felix, a name, uh, a figure, um, but it's not in Baudelaire. I just added him. I even added characters that don't exist. This is what I do in my free time. If you want to become a writer, then yeah, add, translate, make fake translations. It's really fun. A martyr. In the middle of a pool of falcons, I am voluptuous but lame. And marbles, and mar more marbles on the table. I wear a rose dress perfumed with lament. In this room, I have hurt myself, so I become dangerous, fatal, and even the mourner's bouquet cannot save my wolf head. I am a cadaver, but what do I do with it? I am dead labor, but what do I do with it? It's like having blood, but no prey. My visions are pale gold shadows over my eyes, which make my head just ache and ache like some sort of historic idiot. When night falls, I rest on this table and think about the white skin of revulsion. Oh, on this bed, I am the secretary of abandonment. A rosary and coins and gold and the leg, the damned blue leg, there can be no diamond skulls in the world after all. I am the portrait of my provocations and what strange feelings of strangeness I have felt on this table. Oh, I am elegant but irritated. Everyone should desire me. Respond to me, Felix. 
Once you called me deranged and impure, but I am the world, and I am that strange creature inside of you, this mysterious table, hand, and the constant eyeball of death. It's called I Love Wine. I Love Wine. Today, oh my God, I'm just so spaced out and splendid. As I walk this earth without death, without an apron, without being a wife, and so my queer heart transforms into the nostrils of a winter workhorse whose exhalation breaks through the iced tulip sky. Why does everyone want to torture me? All people care about are calendars, clocks, wallets to cut off and time the flesh. Well, I can't take it. So here ich bin, unbalanced and delirious. Here je suis, tapping into some long forgotten intelligence. Oh, Felix, let's go to the Oregon coast and relax inside the boxed wine paradise of our dreams. So um, I'll read uh, one more. Uh, okay, so this uh, Felix, uh, so Baudelaire, my speaker, is, kind of has addiction issues. Um, so that's like his I love wine poem, you know. It's awesome to be drunk. And this is like, this one's called, This Stuff is Poison and It's Gonna Fuck Up My Shit. <laughs> so this is like hangover time, right? Drink too much. So, The wine says the world is either bourgeois or already dead. But by some luxurious miracle, I am still here, <coughs> having emerged once again from that red vapor. And like the sleeping sun, I am the noble one. But there are worse drugs, Felix. There are drugs long and illuminated and born of complete enmity. And they stalk us the way time does, boom, boom, with its mean fist. It's music, but it's also catastrophic. All these poisons, where do they go? Where do they position themselves in the eyes? Where in the soul? I just don't know. I don't want to be their terrible prodigy, their human weight, their fleshy matter inside the vertigo they spin. Don't want to be their sad spinning pawn in the poisoned river of death. Thank you for listening.